Okay, great. I think um, we'll start with some of the introductions and welcomes uh, just while everyone continues to join. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Matt Bass. I'm the Executive Director at DataSite. I'm super excited um, to be here today and uh, for us to be hosting this uh, webinar. It's uh, fantastic. We had um, a huge number of registrants. We have over 200 participants on the webinar today, which is really fantastic. And seeing everyone joining from around the world uh, really shows um, how important this is to us as a community and uh, really shows, um, I guess, energy. And um, I, I think with that, hopefully out of the series, uh, the webinar series, we, we have a lot that we can take, take away from this and, and work together on. Um, so with that, I will hand over to Daniela, who will do a brief welcome and uh, introduction into the webinar and series. And uh, together, we'll then uh, introduce the various panelists and uh, help facilitate a discussion following that. So over to you, Daniela. Thanks, Matt. Let me start with this. Great. Um, all right. Well, hello, everyone. For those who I don't know, my name is Daniela Lowenberg, and I'm based at the California Digital Library at University of California. And in one of my roles, I run the Make Data Count initiative. And I'm thrilled with the amount of people that have shown interest in this. And I think the amount of people that have shown interest is enough to reiterate the importance of the topic. And so I want to give a brief overview of Make Data Count and our perspective on data citations. Some quick housekeeping. Um, we will do all questions through Q&A. So if you don't mind using the Q&A function for that, um, send questions throughout. We're going to have plenty of time for discussion. Also, feel free to use chat. I know in webinar functionality, it's hard to not engage, um, but just be mindful during speaker presentations as it can be really distracting and take away from what the speaker's saying. Um, so be mindful of that. And then feel free to use Twitter at make data count or at data site, especially in follow-up so we can follow up with you, especially for questions and feedback. So make data count is a scholarly change initiative focused on the development of open research data metrics. In the dark blue, you can see what we do. We build and we advocate. So we're made up of organizations like DataSite, Crossref, CDL, DataOne, um, and others, other infrastructure organizations. We also contextualize. So we have a team of bibliometricians studying researcher behavior around data reuse. In Teal, you can see what our values are, which were rooted in transparency, responsibility, um, and open ways for approaching research data metrics, which is at our core and, and why we're here. So to clarify again, as sometimes this can be a little confusing, Make Data Count is an overarching initiative and we're made up of a collective of organizations and individuals invested in the development of research data metrics. There are standards you may have heard of like Scholix and the counter counter practice for research data that some of us have built and been involved in. We use those as frameworks for open data usage and data citation infrastructure. So we see the development of open research data metrics as a journey and standards have been set through work done at groups like RDA, FORCE, ESIP and others. And we have interest in the topics. That was step one. Step two is where we are right now. And it's a pivotal moment where it's required that we focused on broad adoption of standards and open infrastructure around data citation data metrics. Bibliometricians are eager to work on point three and start to contextualize and understand researcher behavior. Um, and if you are able to join our next two webinars that we're about to announce, then you're going to hear a lot more about their work that they begun with this. But the goal is really for us to get to a point of understanding the reach and impact of research data across all scientific disciplines and have responsible assessment um, and reward metrics. And so through our work over the last years in this initiative, we've exposed a few key points that we think the community can tackle to get over this hump at step two and start to get through this. And that's what our webinar series is modeled on. So why aren't we there yet? Well, today we're specifically focused on data citations, which is this first hurdle. And so keeping that in mind, it appears that there seems to be an attitude of let's wait until everything is absolutely perfect until we get started, um, especially for all use cases and all complexities. And that combined with different approaches and inconsistency and in guidance and a lot of reinvent the wheel approaches 
has made it so that we're not able to uncover all data citations, especially through data, through publisher workflows. Um, and so we know that the data citations we're seeing right now are not all of them. And some reasons that we've heard about this. So, you know, how do we attribute this behavior? First, data are difficult. They're not articles. They're much more complex. We also know there's a tension over what publishers want to prioritize in resourcing and retooling at the journals. And even if all publishers did this properly, we would still need resources for text mining to understand citations across the larger scientific landscape, like government documents, cohort data sets, and data sets without DOIs. And so we know that data citations do not fully paint the picture of data reuse, but right now we full, can't even get the full picture of data citations. But instead of hosting a webinar talking through yet again how this is frustrating and we're stuck on it and spinning our wheels on how to change publisher behavior, we are thrilled to announce our set of speakers today who are working on innovative approaches to expose data citations through other tools. And so we want to kick this off by having, uh, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Steph Von Dessant, um, who's going to kick it off with research around this topic. So Steph, over to you. Thank you so much. Rick. Share my screen. Thank you. Um, I was super thrilled to be invited as a guest speaker to today's webinar um, as the title Forage, the hunt for existing data citations uh, really caught my uh, attention for the word choice hunt and existing. My personal involvement with the hunt is that I've actually just came back from a very long and intense hunting trip as I was spending the last three to four years of my life uh, hunting down research data and software reuse indications, which also includes research data citations in scholarly publications uh, within high energy physics and social science. Uh, however, I have to admit that this uh, experience didn't feel much like a hunt trip. It was more like a, a long and extensive field observation study. In fact, um, it takes a lot of patience to actually observe research data citations in the wild. It may take so much um, patience to observe them that some people may believe um, that research data citations are actually a supernatural phenomenon or that they are the unicorns of the open science movement as they are so rare to find just like unicorns. That made me partly caused by the fact that uh, the majority of research data resources and research data repositories uh, has a very encouraging uh, research data citation count of absolutely nothing, no citations found which may indicate that actually research data citations do not exist. However, I found proof in my study that uh, not only the truth, uh, but also research data and software citations are out there. It just depends on where and at what we look at. Uh, for sure, I can uh, prove that the number of uh, research data and software resources that I mentioned in uh, high energy physics related scholarly publications uh, has been risen a lot. This is the green and the blue charts here. Um, however, we, so has also the number of uh, research data citations. However, we tend to overlook them as we mostly refer to research data citations as citations that directly target actually data or software. Uh, this is depicted as the red line that is close to the definitely uh, zero X axis. However, the majority of uh, authors seemed to cite research data rather indirectly, uh, which basically means that uh, if publication A uh, decides to use or introduces software or data and publication B decides to make use of the exact same software and data, um, they tend to, instead of citing the software of a data set directly with a PIT, as you would like to see that, um, and they tend to cite the research publication A instead of citing uh, the data set or the software directly. Thus, even though research data citations are out there, uh, they come in many shapes and colors, and that complicates the hunt a lot. Um, basically, research data citations have many shapes and colors. Uh, for example, they come only as informal data mentions with only uh, ambiguous elements such as the title or even just a fraction of the title, which is depicted on the right side here. Um, and even uh, if they come in form of formal citations, which are depicted in the reference section of scholarly works, um, they contain to a less extent as what we would like to see uh, pits or other trackable uh, citation elements. Uh, this is the small red uh, ray here. It's getting even more complicated if we think about the different types of research data. 
as uh, I found, for example, that software is cited differently than data sets as it's more likely to be used to be referred to with the URL and the name, while data sets are more likely referred to with an ID or an author. Even if we think about more sophisticated or in-depth methods to hunt research data citations, it's getting very complicated. Um, as citations basically hide anywhere in research publications. This is an example of uh, high energy physics, and uh, I found the research data citations and mentions in basically every single section um, of the research publications. And you don't only have to look in the methodology or dedicated data sections, but um, they also uh, hide in rather exotic places such as captions um, or even in figures and tables. Um, there are many reasons why research data citations simply don't live long enough to be seen by us, and that is maybe the reason why we think they may not exist. Um, it starts with the conception phase, uh, where actually most of the citations don't even make it to the light of this world due to an unawareness of the authors or to a lack of pits maybe for software or data. During the writing phase, um, many authors produce idiosyncratic or hard to track citations due to a practice of informal mentions, um, community specific practices, which also includes a huge variety of pits. Um, even those public uh, citations that make it thus far um, have a tendency to vanish during the publication process as uh, data citations are prone to be deleted during the publication workflow. Uh, or only make it as incorrect or ambiguous citations out of there, which are hard to track later. Our metrics may be based on misleading citations, which makes it even more difficult, uh, as there's a citation dilution across multiple citation targets, such as uh, data papers, the data set itself, or related research publications. Um, some authors may miss out to update their latest BibTeX file to the latest version of the data set they used, um, and some uh, research data citation counts may be just splintered across multiple software or data versions. In that sense, there's a lot of work and the hunt is not easy, but on a more positive note, now that you know that research data citations actually exist, um, I wish you happy hunting and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, um, Steph. And I think it's uh, very difficult to get it into that amount of time and, and all the work that you've done. It was great to hear. Yeah, that was 250 pages now in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. very, very, very well done. Um, we'll move um, right into the next um, panelist. And so I'll um, introduce Carly Robinson from Department of Energy, OSTI, um, to talk a bit about the work that they're doing and, and share a bit, about, a bit more about the tools and processes that they have in place. Great, thank you. Um, again, Carly Robinson from the US Department of Energy's Office of Scientific and Technical Information or DOE OSTI. Um, so the mission of our office is to collect, preserve and disseminate um, Department of Energy funded research results. And as part of kind of implementing that mission, we use persistent identifiers, um, both assigning, but also kind of connecting them within the metadata that's submitted to our office with those research results. Um, so to enable that, we um, are members of, you know, the various persistent identifier organizations, Datacite, Crossref, ORCID, um, leading both Datacite and ORCID consortia. And also a part of our mission space is to curate that metadata that is submitted to um, our office to make it as kind of high quality and useful to the general pop public as possible. And so um, this metadata curation works in, it work includes looking for and adding related identifiers such as you know, data set citations into the metadata that we have. Um, and we're fortunate enough to have a team of about um, 10 information scientists who work, are working on that metadata curation. So to kind of go specifically into capturing um, those related identifiers or specifically data citation, um, uh, related identifiers, we get those from a couple of different sources. Um, one of the main sources, which is really exciting, we've seen more of this in recent years, is directly from the, the data creators or the data repositories that are actually providing um, the, the metadata to OSTI for those data records. So they're starting to add in those data citations that they know about, the related identifiers that they know about, um, and including that in the metadata they submit to us. And then that metadata is registered with those data set DOIs. 
But we also have um, historically gotten that information from other sources as well, um, primarily the Stolix API. Um, so basically what, what we would do um, is kind of run those data set DOIs through the Scalix API to find those relationships, um, including data citations, and add that into the metadata that we have. And so we've been doing, we have been doing that for a number of years. Um, you know, kind of historically, the reason that we were doing that is you know, this, the data citations or the additional related identifiers were not necessarily being added by the data creators or data repositories. And so we wanted to try to help provide that information. And so we were working to add that in. Um, we've, we've learned a lot since then. Um, and, you know, a lot more of the data creators and repositories are adding in these related identifiers and um, data citation. So, um, we've actually kind of paused adding um, in the Scalex relationships at this point. Um, we found some inconsistencies about what the data creators and repositories were providing and um, some of what we had were finding from, from those other sources. And so we're working to develop processes now to kind of better understand um, why there might be differences. I think some of it is just, you know, even though those related identifiers or identifying data citations might seem um, easy to do, it, it's actually challenging and kind of calling the, the same, you know, the same relationships, the same thing. Um, sometimes, you know, different people call them different things. And so kind of working to make that a little bit more consistent. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're redeveloping our um, ingest tool for collecting the metadata and research outputs that DOE funds. And with that redevelopment, we're working to um, better understand the sources of the related identifiers and data citations. So, you know, is the source coming, is, is the source directly the data repository or is the source Scalex or, you know, some other outside source? Um, and also to um, kind of have conversations with our community about what um, related identifiers and data, you know, data citations we actually add back into the DOI um, metadata, because ideally this would all be kind of collected within the associated, uh, the metadata associated with the DOI, but we, we want to make sure that what we're adding is correct. Um, and so that's one of the things that we're working on. Um, so I, I think I will stop there, um, but looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Carly, and a, a lot of work that has happened, and I think also, um, you know, provides some sort of excitement or sort of um, um, interest in the next series when we, uh, next webinar in the series about exploring these citations and some of the work that's coming out of, or things that are coming out of the work that you've been doing, um, which is really exciting. Um, moving on to the next panelist, um, I will introduce uh, Silvio Peroni from Open Citations to talk about um, the various um, activities um, at Open Citations. So Silvio, over to you. Thank you, Matt. I, I just let me share uh, my screen because I have a couple of slides that I hope now you can see full screen. Okay, yes. great. Uh, welcome all. Thank you for inviting me in this uh, wonderful uh, webinar. I'm open. Uh, I'm Silvio Peroni. I work at the University of Bologna as associate professor, and I'm director of Open Citations. And I will very briefly introduce what Open Citation does and uh, how we can help, basically, to make uh, metrics and uh, the workflow to uh, obtain metrics more transparent by using our data. Uh, so what is Open Citations? It is uh, a fully free and open scholarly infrastructure uh, that have been created for providing access to a bibliographic metadata and citation data uh, that are coupled with uh, provenance information. We keep track of uh, the source when we uh, ingested a specific source and who have done, who have provided that specific data from the source. Uh, and in addition, we keep track of data changes in, in, in time. So in case uh, a specific metadata or citation data is corrected for any reason, we have the way, let's say, mechanism to reconstruct this history of specific citation data in order to see how they have been corrected uh, in time. 
uh, what open citations enable uh, wants to enable at least is uh, a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, we would like to avoid institutions and in particular independent scholars that are interested in working with this data to pay uh, tens of thousands of dollars annually for uh, accessing even their own citation data. Uh, so uh, in order to provide this, uh, I want just to state that all the data that we provide, but also the services that we provide are totally free uh, without any fee. So anyone can access them. And in particular, the data can be reused uh, for any purpose since we specify a very permissive license, a waiver actually on the data that is the CC0 that enable users of any kind to republish and reuse such citation data for any purpose. Having uh, this availability of open citation data is crucial to uh, enable, uh, to make research assessment exercise and uh, the calculation of metrics in general based on citations more transparent and in particular reproducible. And as a last thing that we want to enable uh, is about the, the, the community, because we are an open scholar infrastructure and we believe that the community should be part of the governance. And indeed we have boards uh, that in open citations that are basically in charge of governing uh, the, the, the infrastructure itself and also to establish somehow uh, future development of, of the infrastructure itself. And the member of this board are coming from uh, the, the scholarly community at large. So it doesn't include only researchers, but also publishers, founders, and, and the like. Um, currently, we provide more than uh, 1.27 billion citation links that are accessible via REST APIs, or uh, you can download all the things, all the data as full dumps. We make available these dumps in three different formats, uh, CSV, uh, and RDF, and also Scholix, since has been mentioned before. Uh, this data, as I anticipated, can be very useful for enabling transparent and reproducible uh, research assessment exercises, in particular when uh, compared to proprietary services, and of course, they can be used for uh, enhance or develop new tools to support your own users, like authors, researchers, students, uh, institutional administrators, and you can make tools for providing metrics to monitor research, new metrics, even new metrics to monitor research, and to improve the discoverability of research products. Uh, the main data source that we have so far from which these uh, billion citation links are actually extracted is Crossref, but we are working on uh, extending the coverage by including in 2022, two additional data sources. Uh, the first one is the iSight uh, National Institute of Health Open Citation Collection, which includes more than uh, 500 million uh, open citations coming mainly for, from the um, medical research. And the other one, the other data source that we are going to use is data site itself. So we are planning to ingest all the citations that are currently included in data site and to put all of them together in our system in order to make all the citations coming from different sources queryable by using uh, programmatic inter interfaces. Uh, very quickly about the coverage, because this is the usual question that I've, uh, I, I receive uh, a lot of time uh, when I present over citations, uh, th the coverage of the thing that we have, of the data that we have. So uh, first of all, we do include uh, not a lot. The main citation that we have are from publication to publication, traditional publication to traditional publication, let's say, but we have also a few citations to data sets and software included, uh, if the data set and software in particular are identified by DOI, which is the only kind of identifier we are only right now, even if we are planning to extend the coverage to additional identifiers in the future. And about the coverage compared with other, other existing citation indexes, uh, some external experts have run a wonderful analysis uh, comparing uh, the, the, the coverage of citations in the indexes that are shown in this slide. So Google Scholar, Microsoft Academic, Scopus, Dimension, Web of Science, and Koki, 
which is our main collection right now. Uh, and uh, we have observed that currently uh, Koki and so open citation is approaching parity with uh, the citation contained in other citation indexes, including uh, Web of Science and Scopus. And we, if we complement the current status of Koki with, for instance, the National Institute of Health Open Citation Collection, we see that actually uh, we get even a better coverage. So this, is, this will be the coverage that we will have compared with the others, let's say in, uh, uh, at the end of this year. And I, I would have a lot of other things to say, but I, I think we can, we can stop here with this introduction. Thank you, thank you so much for, for, for your attention. Thanks so much, Sylvia. Um, all right, last but certainly not least, we have Julia Lane, co-founder of the Coleridge Initiative. And Julia, take it away. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. And, and I'm going to apologize in advance because I'll have to jump off 10 minutes before the hour. It's because I'm actually uh, teaching as we're doing this. So I have to get back to class. Um, so I'm going to come at this from a very different viewpoint. Um, uh, what I'm interested in uh, is figuring out how to uncover the data sets that are in text by reading the publications themselves. Um, and I've come at it both from the researcher point of view, but the leverage that we have now is that in the United States, there's been this big push on evidence-based policy and a very big part of that is with the federal agencies to being told that they have to show how the data are being used. So if you, if you stop for a second, effectively what this does, the, the US federal government is about, depending on how you count it, 20 to 25% of economic activity in the United States. They're a major supporter of research data sets. And so, if you harness the power of these guys, they can fundamentally change the incentive structure for, um, for, for research to get discovered. Um, now, they have been asked to do this before. Uh, under the Obama administration, they were told to make data available. What we basically ended up with, with the open data uh, work is a vomit of data. It's not searchable. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not useful. No one can figure out how it's being used. So, um, you know, this has come up many, many times. Uh, I'm on the National AI Task Force, you know, and but, you know, what they want to know is what data can be used for AI. And so one of the things that we've, that we've talked about both in the AI Task Force and at NIH is to, I'm, 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 uh, I co-chair the data um, uh, group, uh, committee, I'm sorry. Um, and I don't think, I'm, obviously I'm an economist, so maybe I'm biased here, but I don't think trying to force people to do things really works. You kind of want to create incentives for, for good data practices. And you know, despite all the wonderful work that people have been doing in getting data sets to um, get people to, to cite using DOIs, this is an example of NASA, which is a major, major data producing agency, as you can imagine. Um, they're trying to respond to the Evidence Act that I just showed you. So they thought, okay, well, let's see if we can find data sets from by using the DOI. They manually read 100 publications, took them about 14 hours. And, um, you know, as you can see, there are very, very few data citations. And I'm just going to repeat, people don't do it because there is no incentive to do so. So how can we, how can we change that conversation? And it's like when I had a two-year-old boy and I told him to clean his room, and I'd say, go clean your room. He wouldn't clean his room. But when I put a sticker up on the fridge, every time, every day, he cleaned his room. And then if he got 10 stickers, he could go out and buy something. He cleaned his room. 
So what I'm going to argue is that what we want to do is instead of describing data by how they're produced, what we want to encourage people to do, this is NOAA data, this is a very important data set at NOAA that is not being um, the usage of which is not captured to the degree that they'd like. Instead of putting up data by like in the open data, this vomit of information about how it's produced, you know, imagine building an amazon.com for data. No one forces people to document this. It's, it is community curated. So how are we going to do that? Well, the first step is we've got to find the data, not by looking at publicate at the citations. We know they're not there. Um, just actually read the publications and find out what data sets are being cited. Uh, this is an example, uh, but I'm as guilty of this as anyone. I produce many data sets of my time. I never cite them in my references, nor do other disciplines. But you can tell by looking at this publication what the data set name is, how it's being used. So why don't we use machine learning and natural language processing uh, approaches to see if you can automate that. So then you can find the data sets in the publications without forcing people to cite them. You could then also down the road start re rewarding them for citing it to make it easier, but we don't have to do that out of the gate. So we ran a Kaggle competition. Uh, we had 1600 teams. Um, the three winners, uh, uh, you can see what they use very different approaches. If you go on to our show us the data college initiative website, you can see more about the ML uh, methods. But effectively, what that enables you to do is to create a publication to data set dyad. So as soon as you've got the data set, you've got the publication. And then you're able to document and respond to the Evidence Act and show how data are being used. So this is the slosh data. And you can see that we're able then to pull out the topics that are being used. That is being extremely responsive to the uh, Evidence Act and getting the agencies super excited. Once you have, by the way, that information and you've got the data set to publication uh, infrastructure, you can show uh, the, that uh, API in many different ways. This is a very simple version of the showing the data inventory just with a simple Tableau representation that took like five minutes to put together. But, you know, you can imagine being able to show this at scale. Researchers who gets who cite the data sets the most get highlighted. So you've got the incentive structure set up here because you're seeing, oh, I'm showing up as the top cited author and the journals have the same same um, uh, incentive structure. So we've been working with a bunch of uh, agencies uh, and with the Texas Advanced Computing Center to um, institutionalize this. We can do it. Uh, so we're building an API that is based on that set of data set to publication dyads. Uh, and then that enables you to pull in and create administrator dashboards, data inventories, leaderboards automatically. We can do any representation that a, an institution or that a researcher or that a, a government agency wants to do or a federally funded research so, or federally supported uh, data repository like Dryad, for example. So here's basically the idea. You can show by use, you can show how things are put together and, and, and what the value proposition is. This piece is forthcoming in Harvard Data Science Review and obviously we are very grateful to our funders. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Julia. Um, knowing that you have to go, we made, there's two questions actually specifically for you that we can ask real quick before Matt and I go through some others. Um, but we got two for you. One saying, um, is a quote, close reading quote of a set of articles, the most robust way to get a true picture of how many authors are sharing their data. That seems like what the NASA study did. Uh, no, it is articles that are referencing the data set. It's not, they're not sharing it. Um, but 
that is the article of referencing. Oh, I see where they're heading. Yeah, so the basic idea here is that if I produce a data set, right now I have no incentive to share it, right? It's only a problem. I share my publications, however, because I get rewarded for it, right? And uh, if we make data a first class asset, this is the way to do it, right? Because if I show up in lights because people are citing the data set that I produce, that's like creating a citation index for data that is automatically generated and the agencies will reward it. So the agencies get value because they're showing how their data sets are being used. Researchers get rewarded and publishers get rewarded because they can uh, provide information, more information about how valuable the work that is published in their journals is and identify reviewers. The, um, the uh, other piece there is obviously uh, the uh, by describing data set use, you're also encouraging all the things that we like to see, which is the reproducibility and replicability of research, because now I know, in fact, in the class that I'm just teaching, I just jumped off, when we're using administrative records, survey and doctorates and new metrics, and they said, who else has worked with these data who has, for example, strung together the data sets longitudinally over time or created systematic measures? There is no consistent way to answer that question now, but um, with this kind of approach, when people get incentivized to do it, you, you're in much better shape to answer that question. And then one last quick one for you, Julia. Stephanie Haustein asks, most publications are not available as full text. Do you think abstracts and title are sufficient for machine learning approaches? Um, no, so we have to partner with the publishers who do have the full text. So um, we started off partnering with Chorus, which had some full text uh, information. The problem is, and Howard's very open about this, is not particularly well curated because it's open source. Um, so what we've been doing is partnering with Elsevier because they have full text uh, information um, that, that you could do. And then what you could do is with the machine learning approach, it outputs the uh, the rich metadata that is associated with the publication. You don't need to have access to the text. Uh, you just need the metadata that gets pumped out. Seems like a, a lot of the work that Silvio and, <laughs> and others are doing to expose this metadata. That um, would be fantastic. That's right. <laughs> so that was awesome. Those were a set of awesome presentations. Um, okay, so a question for everyone on the panel. Matt and I have two that we want to get to before uh, we go to the Q&A. Um, so for everyone and you unmute and answer on your own. Um, it's always been a priority for folks to surface these citations. Um, but what do you, what messaging do you think is lacking to get stakeholders to invest more in these efforts to harvest data citations? Go for it, Carly. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think echo a lot of what Julia was saying about incentivizing, right? Um, it, there's, we're asking folks to do something that is a little bit more work. And if they're not seeing any benefits to doing that. Um, so, you know, I know there's a lot of work uh, um, around kind of credit and, and getting more, more credit for, for making, um, data available and discoverable and usable um, by others. And I think with that um, it kind of is a pathway to more data citation. And so I think, um, you know, encouraging that with the message of, of data reuse and incentivizing, giving credit, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about tenure processes and things like that. So, so I so, think that that's one pathway. Yeah, so let me, I'm, I'm gonna have to jump off in just a minute. So let me answer Emil's question as well. Um, I answered it in the chat. The game changer here is the Evidence Act. The game changer is agencies have to put out these data inventories and describe the usage. So those are big players. So the question that was asked before, incentives have been tried, yeah, but you've got, there's not, no 
um, there is no big push to make it happen. So everyone just says, oh, it would be nice to have incentives. Well, yeah, um, what we have here is the ability to do it, the ability to put up these usage statistics, and that's, that's where we're going to, the machine learning approaches are going to do it. Sorry. No worries. Sylvia, go for it. Um, yeah, uh, just my personal experience in that, because um, the point to push, to convince actually a researcher to put data citation in their own paper, it's to me is uh, along the lines of what have been already said, but is a, a matter of reward. Uh, I mean, as far as it works in Italy, at least, uh, we are uh, assessed at the national level as a researcher for the publication that we write and the citation that we receive. That doesn't happen with data at all. Even if publication are made, are, are, are just a narrative around the data that we have obtained. So the real what, part of the real work is actually to get this data, to analyze this data and to uh, come up with you know, evidence from the data itself, but the data are not re rewarded at all. So to me, one important point among the others to be addressed is also at, at the, uh, the say institutional level and even at the government level that it is important that uh, the, 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 the agency that do this kind of assessment recognize the fact that today there are not only traditional publication out there, there is a lot of effort spent in doing other things that are crucial for research, that are data sets, that are software development, and all these kind of things. And this stuff must be evaluated, must, must be taken into consideration in the curriculum of researchers, similarly to what happens for traditional publications. That is a crucial point to convince first of all, researcher to cite data, not only other publications to me, at least. Great, thanks. Um, I, I think for, for the set of um, responses to that. I, I, another, um, I guess, area that we were thinking about, and then we'll also go to come back to some of the Q&A, um, is that, we often hear that we need to wait for things to be perfect. And this requires multiple stakeholders across the ecosystem to be involved. And so part of this is, well, we are looking at other stakeholders to make movements or make things better. Um, but it really requires this collective community effort, all of us to make incremental contributions to improve this ecosystem as a whole. And so um, I, I guess what's, how do we keep the community engaged and moving this forwards um, across stakeholders and just interested to hear thoughts from the panelists um, in relation to that? Carly, if you want to kick it off again. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I keep waiting for others um, <laughs> if they want to kick it off. But, um, you know, it, I, I think webinars like this are just incredibly um, helpful to kind of keep the community. I know that, um, you know, data site has, has webinar series and, and has community meetings. And I think that's really important um, The you know, person, the, um, oh gosh, Matt, what is it? The, the persistent identifier um, kind of group that NISO runs um, that the kind of message board, I think is a, is a great place to have these conversations. If anyone the PID forum. Uh, Thank you, yeah. the PID forum. Um, but, but one of the things that I know that we've talked about is, you know, are there ways to kind of bring all of this information to centralize it in some ways? And, and there are a lot of efforts doing this, right? Right, like um, what, what Silvio is doing, what, what Scalix is doing, but are there kind of ways that we can bring this enhanced um, information and metadata together? Because there are, you know, a lot of communities that are doing pockets of this work. And, and so I think having discussions about, you know, how to share that, how to make it more available. I'll say right now, the information kind of lives with us when we don't update it um, within the DOI metadata. So how do we make that more available for others to use?
Steph? Um, I think community work is definitely important because, um, as I observed, that every community has a very specific uh, citation practice and uh, practice publishing practice. So basically, it is not possible for one service like a data site or Crossref to harvest all of the citations because there is no method to harvest all of the citations from different disciplines. While there is services like uh, um, in the social science, for example, there is ICPSR, which is a repository which is very specialized in finding social science related research dissertations and they have a huge um, uh, effort involved and they're very specialized and they find a lot of citations. So if that would be happening in a lot of communities and we have a lot of island solutions, which are very specialized, but very good. But then we also need to think about maybe interoperability because in the end, if we have something like data set event data to bring all of these island solutions together, we also think have to think about um, interoperability. And I think that we have luckily um, many projects that try that. Like I remember uh, Freya, for example, an EOS project that uh, we, we were building the, the pit graph, for example, and try to incorporate software and data citations into the normal landscape around the pits. I, I have to jump off. I just want to respond. ICPSR does precisely what you don't want to do. You, they have three people who are reading publications to pull out the data sets and they only pull out the data sets that are in their repository. The exactly. Like yeah. good, like now, they... why, why in the 21st century are you having human beings sitting and reading publications? It makes no sense. Look, researchers are not going to cite their publications no matter what you do. So, you know, we have to figure out a different way of getting the information about how data are getting used which means let's think systematically about what incentives will work and don't work. I just, you know, let's, let, and Amazon and TripAdvisor and Airbnb, they don't force anyone to do anything. They make it in their own self-interest to provide information about uh, lodging, about books, about restaurants. That's what we need to be thinking about and making it easy for them to do it. So data site and all of these other approaches are terrific, but you know, I, I've been hearing this conversation since I was running the SISA program for 15 years. So, you know, if, if it ain't working, then you say, well, maybe we need to try and do something a little bit different. But anyway, I'm sorry, this, this has been a terrific discussion. And uh, I hope I didn't offend anyone, although I'm sure I did. Sorry about that. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Julia. Bye bye. Nice yeah, I would like to just add a, a few things uh, to what Stephanie uh, actually suggested, because I, I totally agree uh, with the point is that th there is no central solution. I mean, it is impossible to have a central solution to, to, to the whole problem. And to me, the, the, the real challenge that we have uh, today and in the years to come is actually the decentralization problem. So the, the, the fact that there are uh, niche that are providing very good collection repositories of metadata and these things, and they are very complete for that specific niche. And we need to put all these different niche and even the big sources to talk with each other by means of uh, technological protocol. So I'm not, think I'm not thinking about humans here. I'm thinking about setting up a framework that enable uh, interoperability at the infrastructure level and semantic interoperability as well, because the data that someone has may be uh, put in using specific formats that are not, uh, let's say, uh, easily endable by another repository that use a different format for handling this data, different data model for handling this data. So guaranteeing interoperability at the infrastructure level and semantic interoperability in order to even have crosswalks between data uh, to make them interoperable somehow is the, the, the crucial challenge that we have to address. And it is trying to be implemented in several initiatives, including in Europe, there is the European Open Science Cloud that is dedicated in building such uh, uh, an interoperability framework, at least, at least at the European level, but pretty sure that these kind of uh, activities are crucial if we want to, to uh, uh, let's say, come to the next generation 
uh, of these scholarly services. Great, thanks. Um, I think um, great to have um, a few um, few different um, perspectives there and, and sharing about the way forwards. And there's a few um, specific questions in the Q&A and um, uh, we'll, we'll try and um, take these off and also make sure that we get back to everyone on all of these. I don't think we'll be able to get back to all of them. There's a bit of a, um, I guess, common thread. There, there's a bit of a thread around accession numbers. Um, and maybe actually I'll put that to Daniela um, just from the make data count point of view and um, working with um, the various stakeholder, stakeholders. Um, yeah, I think that we're seeing all these questions come in from accession numbers and other sources of PIDs for data. And I think that's exactly why we're hosting this webinar today is, um, you know, as provocative as Julia is, is exactly what she said. We aren't finding what we need to find and we can't scale by saying that we're going to have humans at every organization that are going to find all of these, especially if they're ignoring things like accession numbers. So this is really to say we need to find and expand better ways for us to be able to grab and aggregate into a central location all of these and so it'd be great for NIH and EBI um, to you know to be thinking with us how we can actually do this as opposed to saying DOI is the only way which maybe some of us believe it wouldn't account for everything in the past. Yeah absolutely and I think I'll maybe just you know add from our perspective at data side obviously providing DOIs that you know, we want to make sure that we're getting these into the, the related identifier types and, and capturing the relationship and the relation type in there. You know, it's not just about DOIs, it's it's the bigger picture and that's really important to us. Um, Kali, I see your hands up. Maybe just to add to that, as, as you said, kind of adding these relationships into the DOI metadata, I think is so important, but one of the challenges there is a lot of people are finding these relationships and they don't have control of the DOI metadata. And so, you know, what systems can be put in place to try to somehow connect it with the DOI if you don't actually have control over that metadata? Yeah, and this is, I, I think, Kylie, also getting to some of the conversations that we've had around, well, how do we, you know, allow for an open framework to, to make these claims about relationships between two things that maybe you're not necessarily the, the owner or the registrar of that specific identifier in the metadata. And so we could surface those as well. And I think there's, yeah, there's a few things that we, we have um, underway in different activities that could at least help us make some progress um, on that in, in the nearer term. So Matt, before we, I think we have one last question we want to ask everyone, but before folks drop off, we are very excited to share um, that we are now announcing our second webinar in the series, Explore the Need for an Open Classification System. We are thrilled about the speakers that we have for this on April 7th. We hope you all can join. Um, Paul is going to put into chat right now a registration link. We will also tweet it out, um, but register now. And this is going to be a, a discussion to talk about um, a broader need, even beyond data, for an open classification education system spurred by the work by Stephanie Haustein and her team um, trying to look at data reuse across disciplines. Um, so we're very thrilled. Wanted to make sure everyone sees this. Link in chat, please register. Um, and I think, Matt, we have one last question for the panelists before we log off, yeah? Yeah, so we'd love to hear from you, um, each of you. Do you have a specific message or a specific ask for the attendees today? If I may start. Okay, so uh, not a specific, let's say a very general message and it is very uh, open citations dependent here. Um, open citation is a, a scholar infrastructure organization and that offers every, everything we have as free thing, even services. Uh, but of course, the, the maintenance and sustainability of the infrastructure in the long term is an issue, is a, the bigger, issue, the biggest issue that we have. Uh, so any kind of support uh, 
you, your institutions in particular, can offer to open citations, but not only open citations. I, I mean, in general, open scholarly infrastructures uh, like those, like open citations, is more than welcome. We cannot survive without the support of the community. And that would be a pity, honestly, because I think open citations and other infrastructure are offering great services for the community. And without the support from the community, that is not possible. So what I used to repeat every single time that open citation actually is a community governance infrastructure and as such is, should be considered as a we. So together, all together, uh, are, we are open citation somehow, but we need the support of each other in order to make it possible and make it sustainable in the long term. I, I think also we, there's two ways here. We often try to focus on solving the chaos. Like we have difficulties right now to find citations as they are so chaotic and to track them properly. So we often try to work around how we can track this chaos anyway. But the another way would be also to decrease the chaos maybe, or like declutter it a bit. And that could be by investing also in more trainings or like uh, that the universities could, you know, if you work with young researchers, bachelor, master students, PhD students, that uh, the training actually starts there and that an awareness should start already in, in the earliest possible career for open science practices and uh, for data citations. Because if you start very late as a postdoc or a professor, it may be too late and it may be too hard of a change. So we should also try to invest into trainings and into decreasing the mess so that it can be better at some point. Please cite your data. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just, just also, you know, Matt, I think as you said and others said, it does not need to be perfect. We don't have to have all of the answers to start assigning DOIs, citing data. You know, I think we are doing our best right now. And, and that's okay if not everything's exactly the same. You know, we, we can try to um, continue coordinating and update metadata as needed and things like that. So, so just remember, it doesn't need to be perfect and we should just all do what we can now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's, it's about the journey and, you know, we're in this together and, and working together as an open community is really important. And um, yeah, just, a, a, I think a really nice way to sort of close out this um, and webinar and just, I think from, um, Donella and myself and um, others, um, both from Make Data Count and um, Data Site, so just thanking everyone for attending today. It was great to see so many uh, participants here. We were over 250 participants um, in the webinar, which is really fantastic and really brings a lot of energy to the work that we're doing. And also then thank you to the panelists. Um, it was really great to um, have you here and um, share your thoughts and um, expertise and then finally just a, a reminder that there is the upcoming webinar in the series and would love to have your back here and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation Daniela, do you want to say um anything else um no thank you all we're really looking forward to continuing engagement and um thank you again to the speakers talk to you all soon <laughs>